Okay, thanks for your patience. I think we're, we're up and running. So, uh, yes, in, that's right. So it's been very nice for me to uh, reconnect with uh, lots of colleagues from, from way back when, and obviously there's completely new generation now. <laughs> uh, for me, my time in Munich was absolutely fantastic, and uh, I think the as a uh, center for science, <clears throat> it seems to be a fantastic place. So uh, I shall uh, <clears throat> start with uh, the thank you slide, just in case I run out of time at the end. So uh, here's um, <clears throat> the, the list of my group mem members, past and present, who have contributed to this story. Uh, had some nice quantum optics theory from Nicolas Sangawa, <clears throat> and uh, we've had absolute gold dust for these experiments, the heterostructures grown by um, Arne, <coughs> excuse me, Arne Ludwig and uh, Andreas Wieck at the uh, Raw Universität uh, Borkum. They've provided us with really state-of-the-art heterostructures for these experiments. <coughs> uh, so uh, Mete set the scene extremely nicely this morning about uh, correlating um, spins in solid states uh, systems, even when those spins are, are far apart. I'd actually like to talk about something that's that's even simpler than that, <clears throat> and and this is simply about the the quantum particle of light, the uh, the photon. We would like to be able to create, <laughs> manipulate, and detect individual photons. So um, here's a quantum technology perspective, why that would be an interesting thing to do. You can imprint quantum information on a photon and then send it over long distances. The photon is the only known way to, to do that. And that renders the photon absolutely crucial to uh, quantum communication, for instance, quantum key distribution. In the meantime, there are quite sophisticated protocols for carrying out quantum communication. Um, a very nice one is device independent quantum key distribution, complete mouthful. But according to this one, the security um, is guaranteed simply by the laws of quantum physics uh, as we know it. <clears throat> All the hacks you can come up with are inoperative. And then uh, another one is to use, uh, instead of individual photons, entangled clusters of photons for the quantum communication. Uh, roughly speaking, you have a highly entangled state. The quantum information is distributed over it. You send half the <coughs> state to one person, the other half to the other. And the magic is that if you lose a few photons along the way, the quantum information can uh, still be, be, uh, be retrieved. Uh, more controversially is to use a photon as a quantum bit in a quantum processor. And... Uh, uh, quantum simulation has some trajectory actually at the moment. Um, uh, the problem called boson sampling has been implemented uh, using single photons, in fact, created with a device I shall, uh, I shall show you. And in fact, the, the recent claim, this is from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, is that quantum advantage has been demonstrated with this system. And then uh, this is... Um, <coughs> Uh, a subject for strong opinions and certainly debate, uh, photonic systems may be a very nice way to implement uh, measurement-based quantum computing. So single thought photons are uh, important. And one primary task you might ask, how can I create a single photon, a single quantum particle of light? And this is the scheme that uh, underpins my, uh, my entire lecture. It really is simple. We imagine that we have a two-level atom. This has a ground state uh, and an excited state. Uh, initially, the system is in its uh, ground state. And then we excite the system up to the excited state, then hands off. We let the atom decay, and the atom decays from the excited state to the ground state by creating one photon. This is called spontaneous recombination. Excite the atom, fingers off, let it decay. It creates one photon in the process. And the reason this concept is so powerful, you excite it once, you get one photon, then the atom is flat on its back, exhausted. 
it can't create another photon until you excite it a second time. So this is potentially an on-demand source of single photons. Whenever we want a photon, we excite the atom and let it decay. And this process creates the photon for us. That's the concept. It's as uh, simple as that. So uh, you have a choice to make. What atom are we going to take? Uh, I might say uh, any regular atom will have many more than uh, two levels. Uh, that's okay, provided the, the ground state is the ground state. And then we just pick out one of the excited states. Maybe there are many more further up in energy, provided they're off resonance with our excitation. We can safely ignore them. So, <clears throat> um, before I answer that question, which atom are we going to take? Here's some uh, very basic quantum optics. <laughs> Imagine you do this on a single atom. Uh, the first question you'd like to ask, <clears throat> does this create photons one by one? For sure, light comes out, but every time we excite the atom, does one and only one photon come out? And the standard way to answer that question is to send the output onto a beam splitter. Each output of the beam splitter is uh, equipped with a single photon detector. And then you look to see how these single photon detectors apply. So if you do the quantum optics properly, then the output state is actually a superposition. <clears throat> the photon is in mode A and not in mode B, <clears throat> plus in mode B, but not in mode A. When you do a projective measurement, you will get a click on either detector A or detector B, but you won't get a click on both to get detectors together. If you like, this is the uh, the particle nature of the photon. The experiment, to all intents and purposes, looks as though the photon had to make a choice. Does it go straight to detector A or does it go straight to detector B? This beam splitter can't take the photon, cut it in two and send equal contributions to both detectors. And this uh, is called a measurement of the autocorrelation function. And this particular setup is the hambry brown twist experiment. <laughs> The other question you'd like to ask, and this is really important, for instance, for device independent quantum key distribution, is to what extent are the photons the same? And for many contemporary applications, they should be identically the same in all degrees of freedom. So this means the frequency should be the same, the shape of the wave packet should be the same, the polarization should be the same. And to do this experiment, you do a related experiment, but now you take two photons and you bring them together at the same instant in time on a beam splitter. Now, if, you, if, if these photons are identical in all respects, then a simple calculation from the quantum optics will tell you that this is the output state. You get two photons in mode A and none in uh, mode B or vice versa. And uh, the one one contribution disappears. So if the photons are identical, then it's impossible for one photon to go into mode A and the other photon to go into mode B. And this is a demonstration of the, the wave nature of uh, single photons. So this is an experiment we do in the lab to ask the question, to what extent are the photons the same? If the click detectors click at the same moment, then that tells us <coughs> that we have not succeeded in creating uh, <coughs> identical photons. If, however, the, pho the detectors A and B never click at the same moment, then we've succeeded. Hmm. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the um, uh, choice of atoms. So my background is in semiconductor physics. So uh, can, can we find a solution to this problem of creating single photons using semiconductors. And uh, um, here's a little commercial for semiconductors. They uh, underpin very much of the technology that we, uh, we rely on in the contemporary age. One example is the semiconductor laser diode. The first one was made in the Hughes Labs in the US in 1962. Uh, in the meantime, this was a terrible laser, by the way, very inefficient, had to be cooled below room temperature to get it to work and so on. But nevertheless, it was a laser. In the meantime, we have beautiful lasers. 
They're very small, they're very efficient, and they uh, underpin uh, long distance uh, uh, internet traffic. Here's a snapshot of uh, a random example. This is a semiconductor laser, and it just showcases what the semiconductor toolbox has to offer. There's a gain medium, that's a series of quantum wells. There's a, uh, there are two mirrors. These are Bragg mirrors created during the growth of the heterostructure. Once the wafer has been grown, then uh, some etching has been taken place and some contacts applied uh, and so on. And you end up with this uh, really quite wonderful device. So from my background, the question is this, can we use this technology to build a single photon source? And the answer based on everything shown there is, is no, we have everything apart from the crucial ingredient and that's the atom. What's going to play the role uh, of an atom in uh, a semiconductor-based single photon source? <laughs> so uh, here's the answer. <clears throat> this is a so-called uh, quantum dot. <clears throat> this is a cross-section of a quantum dot <clears throat> grown by the standard technique in the field, molecular beam epitaxy. <clears throat> uh, relevant for this audience, it has a nano size. <clears throat> so it's about 20 nanometers in diameter and about 10 nanometers high. And the nice thing is it forms spontaneously during the growth of the semiconductors. In other words, once you know how to do this, you can slip a layer of quantum dots into uh, any semiconductor heterostructure you like. To be a bit more specific in this case, the, the host material is gallium arsenide. That's a completely standard material for both electronics and uh, optoelectronics, and the quantum dot itself uh, is formed of indium arsenide. This is uh, a semiconductor with a with a lower lower band gap. <laughs> There's another picture. This was actually recorded during my time in Munich. It's uh, that, of that vintage. These are quantum dots on the surface of uh, gallium arsenide. This shows uh, actually a relevant point. Some are big and some are small. And that has consequences for our single photon source, as I'll explain uh, uh, later. And then here's a cartoon of this molecular beam epitaxy. Um, you take a gallium arsenide substrate, you put it in an ultra, ultra high vacuum chamber, and from ultra, ultra clean atomic sources, you, uh, you create gallium arsenide. And if you choose the conditions correctly, <laughs> then you can get the material to grow one atomic layer by one atomic layer. <laughs> to form the quantum dots, you uh, turn on the indium source. And when you've grown the quantum dots, you turn off the indium source and then uh, carry on. <laughs> okay, so here's um, um, the, uh, the underlying semiconductor physics. How can this quantum dot represent a two-level atom? So uh, remember your semiconductor physics, uh, there are valence states which are occupied, then there's a gap, an energy region in which there are no states at all, and then conduction states higher up, which are normally unoccupied. The quantum dot represents a confinement potential, so it turns the energy bands into discrete energy levels. This is uh, the semiconductor analog of the hydrogen atom. So instead of bands, now we have discrete energy levels and without doing anything, the valence levels are filled. Uh, according to the Pauli principle, you can fill each level with two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. In gallium arsenide, a photon can come along and excite one of these valence electrons across the fundamental gap to one of the states in the, uh, associated with the conduction band. And I've shown that process over there. So now we've got one electron in a conduction state. We're missing one electron in a valence state. In semiconductor language, the electron is called an electron and the missing electron is called a hole. And the combination of electron and hole together is called an exciton, which I've labeled X. So this is how the quantum dot mimics a two level system, the ground state is when all the electrons are nestled neatly in the valence levels. The excited state is when we've excited one electron across the gap uh, to create the exciton. 
And I would say 10, 15 years ago, there was hope <coughs> rather than an expectation that this would work, that this would actually mimic a two-level atom. And uh, uh, the community has demonstrated this is true <coughs> uh, and to a very large degree in the meantime. So uh, this is the story I'd like to tell you. <coughs> I've made my choice. I'm going to use the semiconductor atom, a quantum dot as my two level atom. And now I'm going to try and make a single photon source. So what we'd like to do, we'd like to send in a trigger. In my case, that will be a laser pulse that will excite my atom. And then I'm going to have some experiment with some optical fiber uh, representing the output. And I'd like every time I send in a laser pulse, to generate one single photon at the output of the, the fiber. That's what I'd like to do. And uh, there are many problems, but I would say there are two very significant ones. <laughs> the first one is contemporary applications insist that the photons are identical, indistinguishable in the language of the subject. <laughs> How do we do that <laughs> with our noisy semiconductor solid state environment? And then if we uh, have a quantum dot sitting somewhere inside gallium arsenide, for sure it will create photons, but they will head in all possible directions. How do we funnel them effectively into this single mode fiber? So let me just um, comment on the first thing. This is all about noise. <clears throat> if you have a noisy environment, you get noisy photons and noisy photons are definitely not identical one to the next. So uh, uh, as a community, we did lots of spectroscopy experiments back in the day. Uh, here's one. We took a single quantum dot. We took a um, highly coherent laser. We scanned the frequency of the laser across the quantum dot, and we measured the, uh, the, the scattered signal from the quantum dot itself. This is called resonance fluorescence in the business. And what you find is you get... Um, uh, line widths. These are three, in this case, 400 megahertz in atomic uh, units. Um, how do I interpret that? If the system behaves perfectly, then the line width should be simply determined by the lifetime of the upper state. So if tau is 0.8 nanoseconds, do the maths, the line width h bar divided by tau you get around 200 megahertz. So even in these early experiments, the line widths are actually close to this so-called uh, lifetime limit. We did the same experiment another time, but now we did the experiment more quickly and more quickly and more quickly. So we scanned the, the laser more and more quickly over the quantum dot resonance. And you find that if you do this quick enough, this involves doing this experiment in around 10 uh, microseconds, you find that the lifetime actually goes down to this uh, to this lifetime this lifetime limit, and this is uh, uh, ideal behavior despite the complexities of the semiconductor environment. And our recipe for getting these uh, very nice line widths: it's resonant excitation, high quality material, low temperature. Met is right. This does not work at uh, elevated temperatures for Kelvin in this particular case. And we have a very particular heterostructure design that uh, I won't go into that today, but we think that's, uh, that's, that's important. Noise, where could noise come from? Um, the atoms in the solid jiggle. <clears throat> These are called phonons. The jiggling of the exciton can uh, disturb the exciton in the semiconductor. Uh, one interacts with the, the other, the lattice is polar, the exciton is essentially a dipole, so they interact. That's one source of noise. We're fortunate with gallium arsenide that this interaction is relatively benign compared to uh, other materials. You can have lots of charge noise in the semiconductor. This is electrons far from the quantum dot moving around from charge trap to charge trap or even worse, hopping into the quantum dot and hopping out again. In the present devices, the charge noise is so low that it, um, it's, it's really a very benign influence on the noise that we measure. 
And that's uh, <coughs> largely thanks to our good heterostructure design and the efforts of our colleagues in Borkham. <laughs> The other source of noise, all the atoms in gallium and arsenide, also indium, they have a nuclear spin. <clears throat> these nuclear spins are not controlled in these experiments. These nuclear spins, their spins fluctuate, and this actually creates uh, magnetic noise. And uh, in fact, we think this residual broadening on long time scales is actually determined by this uh, nuclear spin noise. In fact, I'd hope Mete would talk about this uh, this particular subject this morning. He didn't. Mete's uh, done some spectacularly nice experiments where he's been able to suppress this spin noise in the nuclei by cooling them down with uh, laser cooling techniques taken more or less from uh, atomic physics. This is really spectacular. So here's an experiment that's really, really, really sensitive to noise. <clears throat> we take uh, one quantum dot in one cryostat we take a second quantum dot in another cryostat. We create a photon from quantum dot one, a photon from quantum dot two. We do this standard traditional experiment in quantum optics. We bring the photons together at a beam splitter and we look for two photon interference. And this experiment works really beautifully. In this case, the visibility, <clears throat> if the photons are completely identical, we would get 100% in this experiment, we get uh, 93%. This, is a, this experiment is sensitive to all the no noise sources in cryostat one and all the noise sources in cryostat two. <laughs> so this is something that I think is, uh, is a very nice result. And for anyone who knows their quantum optics, what's quite nice here, if you detune in frequency one of the quantum dots by half a line width, <clears throat> then uh, you see these very nice quantum beats in the, uh, the autocorrelation function. And they're so pretty, this also tells you that the, the photons you, uh, you create <coughs> are, are the same. Right, so that was uh, the indistinguishable photon bit. <coughs> it's all about noise. Um, in the last decade, we've managed to push the noise right down in these, in these, uh, in these systems. Uh, we're in reasonable shape, I would say. The next challenge is how on earth do you persuade all these photons to go in the same direction? Uh, and in my particular experiment, go into this one single mode fiber. If you do nothing, they head off in all directions in space and uh, uh, they're all going into lots and lots of different modes. You need to do something <laughs> and you need to do something to the photonic environment and uh, the approach we decided to take, along with many other groups, is to put the quantum dot inside a cavity. And the, uh, the hope inside the cavity, the quantum dot will feel the presence of the cavity via the vacuum field. And this vacuum field will stimulate the uh, <coughs> photons and the photons thereby go very precisely into the cavity mode. Uh, if it works. So this is a way to put the photons into one specific mode, the, the cavity mode. So how are you going to do that? Um, uh, these are, and this is a, a famous picture from a review paper that's almost 20 years old now, but I think it's still relevant. Um, you could take a semiconductor and uh, do some uh, aggressive nanofabrication to create a cavity. And uh, one of the popular choices is to make what's called a micro pillar. That's the one uh, top left, or possibly a photonic crystal uh, on the right. What you want in this business is a large value of vacuum electric field. To get that, you need a nice cavity. That means a high Q factor and a small volume. And these are perhaps not unsurmountable problems, but it's a problem that's accompanied the field. There's a bit of a trade-off between the Q factor and the volume. As you make the cavities smaller and smaller, the, uh, the losses tend to go up and the Q factor goes down. If you look at it from uh, the point of atomic physics, they have uh, macroscopic cavities. So the, the mode volumes are rather large, but they can have spectacularly high Q factors, 10 to the seven. So we uh, tried to look for a sweet spot. We want the, the low mode volume of the monolithic cavities together with the high Q factor of the atomic physics cavities. 
So uh, we did something that's perhaps not completely inspired. We simply took the design from atomic physics. <clears throat> this is a Fabry Perot cavity straight from the optics textbook, and we miniaturized it. <clears throat> so here the uh, the lens the the mirrors are millimeters apart. The the radius of uh, curvature of the mirror is hundreds of microns, possibly even millimeters. In some applications, we shrunk everything down. Uh, to the, the micro scale. So this is the cavity we came up with. Uh, we have a top mirror. Um, it's curved, but now the radius of curvature is 10 microns. Uh, we make that in, in silica, in a glass substrate. Our bottom mirror is, is planar, and uh, the bottom mirror is, is part of the, uh, the semiconductor uh, heterostructure. So this is not a monolithic device. You have a semiconductor sample, the top mirror, you put the top mirror on top of the sample and uh, away you go. The separation between these mirrors uh, is, uh, is just a micron or two. And what you can see here is a simulation of the cavity mode inside this cavity. And uh, what you can see, it uh, extends roughly a free space wavelength uh, in all three directions. I showed you the, uh, the slide a while ago of these quantum dots on the surface. Some are big, some are small. We also don't know exactly where they are in the plane. This is also a problem that's accompanied the field. We haven't solved that problem, but we've got a very nice workaround. By making this non-monolithic device, what we can do is fix, for instance, the top mirror in place, and then we move the sample in the plane to find a nice quantum dot. When we found a nice quantum dot, we move the, the semiconductor sample up and down to match the quantum dot frequency with the, the cavity frequency. So in this way, we can circumvent uh, one of the main drawbacks of this uh, self-assembly process. So uh, here's a slide just for Alex's benefit. This is Alex Hergula, PhD, back in 2006 or something, something like that. This was the main result. We did a transmission experiment on a single quantum dot. It's conceptually extremely simple. You just take a microscope, put your sample in the focus, measure what goes through, and then you sweep the, the frequency of the laser. And when you hit the resonance, you see a transmission dip. And this was in the category of heroic experiment back then, the transmission dips. Uh, was spectacularly small. You can see it's here 0.2%. Put the same quantum dot uh, inside a cavity. The cavity massively boosts the light matter interaction. And this transmission dip goes from 0.2%. It goes all the way up to about 99% in this experiment. This is quite fun. If you think about it, we have this tiny object, 20 nanometers across. The wavelength of light is about a micron in this experiment. Nevertheless, this quantum dot in this experiment acts as a perfect mirror. Okay, so uh, uh, John, when did I start? Uh, you're doing okay. I'm doing okay, doing okay. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, present two experiments um, with this particular system. Um, the first one is uh, the... Uh, uh, the strong coupling experiment. Uh, what does this mean? Well, here we have a system, uh, a two-level system interacting with the cavity field inside the cavity. If a photon is created in the cavity, it can leak out, uh, either via scattering mechanism or hopefully via one of the mirrors at rate kappa. And also when we excite the quantum dot, we hope that the quantum dot will put a photon into the cavity mode. It may not, of course, this photon may end up in a different mode altogether, in which case it's lost from the experiment. And that's rate gamma. And in the strong coupling regime, this good coupling, the vacuum field with the quantum dot is bigger than both the <coughs> photon decay rate and the atomic decay rate, hopefully by a large margin. <laughs> So to try this experiment, we used uh, a very uh, reflective top mirror. 
that's the choice that, that we that we made. <clears throat> uh, Meti very kindly flashed this up this morning, and uh, we see the perfect Z signature of strong coupling. What you see, maybe take the, the plot on the left, the, the cavity frequency uh, is fixed. And uh, in this experiment, we tune the quantum dot frequency. That's via this gate tuning VG. So we have quantum dot detuning on the X axis. And on the Y axis, we have the laser frequency that's used to uh, probe, the, probe the system. And you can see when the cavity and the quantum dot come into resonance, you get uh, this creation of so-called polaritons, this very nice uh, avoided crossing in the experiment. So uh, from this experiment, you can get all the uh, vital statistics of the system. For instance, you can move the quantum dot well out of resonance with the cavity, just measure the cavity, and uh, we get uh, a, a Q factor of 500,000 in this experiment. So this has exceeded all our expectations. Uh, in actual fact, we have created a high Q factor, small mode volume cavity. This is exactly what we wanted to achieve. And then when you bring the quantum dot into resonance with the cavity, you form these uh, mixed states. These are atom photon mixed states, polaritons, if you like. From the separation, you get the coupling. And from the, the line widths, you can work out the atomic decay rate. <laughs> and the cooperativity, that's a good coupling squared divided by the product of the bad couplings goes over 100 uh, in this system. Uh, you can do similar experiments in the, uh, the time domain. <clears throat> um, I won't go into details here. This is a measure of the autocorrelation function as a function of delay. You see these very, very nice oscillations without going into any detail. Let me just say that this is a quantum of energy that goes from the atom into the field and then from the field back into the atom again. And you can see that we get uh, five or six oscillations of this quantum of energy between atom and photon before the system uh, decays. <clears throat> Okay, so this strong coupling uh, regime is potentially uh, useful. Uh, for instance, you can create a photon-photon gate uh, with, this, uh, with this scheme. Uh, it's not an easy business, uh, and I'm trying to create a single photon source here. So to do that, actually, you want a less reflective top mirror and work in what's called the, uh, the weak coupling regime. So in this case, once a photon is created in the cavity, you want to get it to leak out rather quickly before it has time to be reabsorbed by the atom. So you, photon is created and before the atom can reabsorb it, it escapes. So that's the regime here. And uh, if you grind through the quantum optics, the condition you have to fulfill is kappa equals 2G. This is the Goldilocks cavity. Too much cavity puts us in the strong coupling regime. Then there's a finite chance of this photon being reabsorbed by the atom. Uh, too little cavity and uh, the cavity does not do its job in putting, uh, in creating a quantum dot photon in the cavity mode. So that's it. <laughs> to switch from one experiment to the other, all we did is lower the uh, reflectivity of the top mirror. And in actual fact, uh, now we're at finesse values of 500, a Q factor of 10,000. So these are, at least by atomic physics standards, these are, these are rather modest numbers. Is uh, life in the lab on a good day? You find a quantum dot, you center it with respect to the, the cavity mode, and then you move the sample up and down to find the resonance with the uh, the cavity frequency. So that's the cavity frequency detuning is on the X axis. Uh, we can also detune the quantum dot frequency with our bias if we want. That's on uh, the top plot on the Y axis. And then you simply measure the signal emerging from your signal, uh, from your experiment, and you, uh, you maximize that and then uh, sit on the peak and you're good to go. To demonstrate, uh, conclusively that the cavity is doing its job. 
you can leave the quantum dot frequency fixed, sweep the, the cavity frequency and measure the decay rate. <clears throat> and you can see very, very nice peak. This is exactly what you expect from the quantum optics textbook. When the cavity encourages the atom to put the photon into the cavity mode, the <clears throat> spontaneous emission rate uh, is, is enhanced. And that's exactly what you see here. And in fact, you can measure exactly this factor on and off resonance by tuning the cavity. And you can see the contrast here is about a factor of 10. This is actually quite curious as well. Quantum dots are by their very nature fast emitters of photons. In this particular sample, the, without the cavity, the radiative lifetime is uh, 500 picoseconds. With this cavity enhanced uh, spontaneous emission, the decay rate goes <coughs> up by a factor of 10, such, the, uh, such that the spontaneous emission time is now just 50 picoseconds. And in fact, we've uh, achieved 20 picoseconds in one of our experiments. Yeah. Things go fast in the world of uh, quantum dots, even faster when you put them inside uh, cavities. Uh, there are two peaks here. That's uh, a technical detail that I've decided to, to skip. So now we have an experiment, <clears throat> lights coming out, <clears throat> the, uh, the optical fiber. We do the experiments I described at the beginning. First, do the photons come out one by one? And to do this, we record this uh, autocorrelation function. And it's the absence of signal at delay zero that tells you to a very, very large degree, the photons come out one by one. Very occasionally, we get two photons for one trigger, but al almost all the time we, <laughs> we get either zero or one. Then you can uh, bring two photons together at a beam splitter and ask yourself the question, are the photons the same? So to do this experiment with just one source, we create one photon, this, we create another photon, the first photon uh, we send around the lab <coughs> such that the first and the second arrive at the beam splitter at exactly the same moment in time. We can make them deliberately different <coughs> by adjusting their polarizations to be orthogonal. That gives us the signal in gray. And then we make them maximally indistinguishable by putting them in the same polarization state. And that's the signal in red. And you can see this uh, very nice two photon interference <coughs> effect and the visibility is around 98% in, uh, in this experiment. Um, <coughs> And now the, uh, the efficiency of this source, if I send in a trigger, what's the probability that a single photon pops out of the final optical fiber? Uh, the uh, answer to that question in this particular experiment was 55%, 57% the best we've achieved so far. Um, let me just uh, run through this. <coughs> This gives you some appreciation why this quantum technology business can be so challenging. The overall efficiency is a product of four probabilities. So if any one of these four is low, then uh, the experiment essentially fails. All four have to be high. <laughs> the first one is what I've called pi. If we send in a laser pulse, what's the probability that we excite our quantum dot into the excited state? We think that's 96%. <laughs> now we've got an excited atom, it decays. What's the probability that the photon goes into the cavity mode and not into some other mode? <laughs> that's what we think is 86% in this experiment. Now we've got a photon in the cavity. What's the probability that it pops out through the top mirror? This is the output we want. We think that that's uh, very high in this experiment, 96%. Now we've got a photon heading towards the optical fiber, but it has to go through a number of optical elements and it has to be focused into the optical fiber itself. What's the probability that it finds its way to the end facet of the final optical fiber? That's the weak link in our present experiment. So we think that's 69%. And if you multiply all these probabilities together, we actually come up with the, the number that we, uh, 
we measured for the, the overall efficiency. So uh, this is a table, state-of-the-art uh, single photon sources. Um, maybe two points. <clears throat> this semiconductor system, whether you choose the micropillar route or our open microcavity route or another one, uh, is outperforming uh, <clears throat> other uh, other schemes uh, at the moment. So uh, that's a very nice thing for solid state technology. Uh, a second point is if you run, for instance, uh, a boson sampling protocol, which involves uh, 10 photons, then the overall efficiency of the experiment will be the efficiency of the single photon source to the power 10. So that means that marginal gains in the efficiency of the source have big implications downstream for running uh, running applications. I don't want to uh, push this particular cavity technique too too much. I think the overriding point is if if you build cavities or some other optical device while keeping the noise right down, then you can uh, get this uh, this uh, this nice uh, this nice performance. Um, how much more time do I have, John? One minute, right? Okay. So, uh, um, where do, where where do, do we? I mean, we as a as a community actually go from here. The single photon sources uh, should be made better. We'd like to include spin in the game, and their Mete's contributions are really profound. I think because for the first time we have coherent photons and a reasonably coherent spin. So with this approach, a single photon source together with spin manipulation can create uh, spin photon uh, entangled pairs. And then if you repeat this protocol and then read out the spin at the end, you can create these photonic cluster states. And that is one potential building block for photonic measurement based uh, quantum computing. So uh, I'm out of time. It's been a real pleasure to come and give this talk. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So Richard, thanks very much for this fantastic talk. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. So uh, questions, please. There's one right at the back or in the middle. Let's start at the back because those are the ones. Thank you. Thank you also for the talk. Uh, I have a question too. I think it, this was your previous slide before this one um, where you had the 55% no, uh, detection efficiency. That's right. Is this? Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, I've gone too far. This one. This one, exactly. How do you estimate those numbers? I mean, the optics one seems the most intuitive to me, how you would determine that with a different experiment. Oh, okay, how... these, uh, these, these, these are very good questions. So, um, uh, so uh, pi, <clears throat> what's the chance that we excite the quantum dot? We actually get that from the curve on the right that I didn't talk about. This is signal against uh, the square root of laser power. Uh, and it's, this is essentially a, 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 a pi pulse that we apply. But if you look, this is far from a standard Rabi oscillation. A Rabi oscillation, you expect the signal to go up and then come down to, to zero again when you have a pulse area of two pi. We get these really weird uh, um, Rabi oscillations. It turns out that um, you can describe these. What you have to do is consider how the laser pulse has changed when it goes into the cavity. And uh, um, we've managed to get a model that uh, describes these oscillations rather well. That's the, the black curve. So on the basis of that, we can use the model to, to tell us uh, what this number pi is. From the experiment alone, you have, I mean, uh, we, we, we don't know, but this agreement with the model we, we use to tell us what it is. Uh, the beta factor, that's, um, uh, that's essentially from this experiment, assuming that the uh, standard quantum optics description is correct. <clears throat> one two level uh, system, one, uh, one, one, one cavity mode. <clears throat> uh, that's a nice feature, I would say, in these experiments. We know really precisely what the Purcell factor is. 
oops, excuse me. Uh, the kappa top over kappa total, this, this one is very, very high. And uh, actually from the strong coupling experiment, the Q factor is so high that you can measure the residual losses in the, the mirrors and so on. We make the assumption that there are no residual losses in the top mirror. And that gives us this 96% number. And this 69% number, we've done exactly what you suggested. We build a replica on the lab bench and send some light from, from one into the other and see how much uh, comes through. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering if and how your cavity affects the polarization or the transitions. Oh, right, right. In, okay, in this, um, th this is also, a, this is a good question. So uh, uh, I think more or less, uh, this is the detail I skipped over here. So, um, right, deep breath, everybody. The, um, the fundamental mode of the cavity in the textbook is unpolarized. Uh, in practice, the fundamental mode splits into two. <laughs> one is H polarized and the other one is V polarized. Um, and this small frequency shift here is around 50 gigahertz between the H and the V polarized mode arises from a birefringent somewhere. We're pretty sure it's inside the semiconductor, but which part of the heterostructure we're not so sure. So this, this is some birefringence we don't have under control in this experiment, but it's there. Uh, so in actual fact, uh, we send the V polarized laser light in, it goes in to the cavity via the V polarized mode. Uh, it excites the quantum dot via its tail. And then the quantum dot feels the presence of the H polarized mode more than the V polarized mode. So uh, with this uh, probability beta H, it puts a photon into the uh, H polarized mode, and then it's an H polarized photon that comes out the cavity. And then, and then we try not to change its polarization as it goes all the way to, to the detector. <laughs> okay, thanks. Did that answer your question? Yeah, can I ask one further? Um, would that become problematic if you want to combine that uh, with spins? Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I think so. And I, I think uh, there are different schemes you can think of. And I mean, I would say this, this mode splitting it for spin experiments, ideally, it should be very big. And then you just work with one mode, or it should be very small that you that it's not visible. And we're in an in between region at the moment. Uh, so yes, yes, uh, I think is the simple answer. So we uh, we'd like to do something about it. We've tried, uh, you can tune this mode splitting actually by applying a stress to the sample. We've, we've, you can also apply an electric field and that uh, via the electro optic effect that also changes the, the mode splitting. Unfortunately, we don't have enough tuning at the moment to, uh, to cover 50 gigahertz. Another option might be to uh, inbuild, create a top mirror with exactly the opposite by refringence with a hope to uh, to cancel them. So that's that's a journey we we haven't really started Thank yet. You. So a very very good question. So other questions? <laughs> Actually, we we're, we're well on time. We would have at the back there someone, yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. I have a question regarding fabrication of these devices. Um, you mentioned that it's molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, are there any routes that? Um, uh, such quantum devices can be built without the epitaxial methods or with direct deposition or like um, other methods? Uh, let me just. Uh... Okay, here's my cartoon of uh, MBE. Sorry, the, the question again. <laughs> so the question is uh, whether the roots within the quantum dot community were. Uh, this kind of devices can be built without the epitaxy and without the big MBE machines that are required for it. Uh, I didn't catch that. So if they, if they can be realized <laughs> without the epitaxy. Oh, I, I see. Uh, um, I mean, um, uh, you know, there's this whole parallel community working on uh, these uh, nanocrystals or colloidal quantum dots, as we used to used to call them. Um, the uh, the advantage here is that the the noise is so is so fantastically low. You can switch to uh, an alternative uh, um, 
wafer deposition scheme, this vapor phase uh, epitaxy. It's much simpler, much cheaper, much, much faster. Um, not sure to what extent you could uh, reproduce uh, these results. The problem there is the material quality is, um, is, 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 is really not so high. I mean, we have, we have such clean material here. <laughs> uh, they're essentially um, within a hundred nanometer by hundred nanometer by hundred nanometer cube. There's at most one defect. It's, it's really spectacular. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think um, th th this um, does exist on, on, on an industrial scale. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, 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 if this ever were uh, a big technology in, in, in some sense, then, then there are ways to, to scale it up. <laughs> Good news is if you make one hero sample, you get hundreds of millions <laughs> of quantum ones, and they're all good. Other questions? So I do, oh, there is one, so the back there. Thank you for a, a very nice uh, overall uh, talk. I have actually a very basic question. So you've been um, telling us how you really reduce noise to an absolute limit. Um, I was wondering how does noise mostly manifest in your experiments and how do you actually reduce, uh, or how do you know, sorry, the, how do you know um, the sources of your noise in the end. Can you? How can you distinguish these contributions? Um, okay, these these are these are these are very good questions. Um, we have. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> we have these uh, these old experiments. Um, uh, this one, and uh, we found a trick. Um, that um, we could set up the, the system and the laser frequency such that we were sensitive to charge noise and not spin noise or vice versa. That was the, that was the key trick in, this, uh, in this, this paper from 2013. That was, that was our, that was our key, key trick. And then uh, um, if, you, <coughs> if you worked hard, you can actually construct a, a noise spectrum. So you get the charge noise spectrum and the spin noise spectrum. You know, noise as a function of frequency for both individually for this for this particular system. <laughs> okay, so we have come to the end of our time for the session. So let's start by thanking both our speakers.